Yeah, thanks, Gary, and thank you, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to present to the Little Salmon River Watershed Collaborative this evening. Um, my name is John Lafrido, and I'm with the Idaho Resource Board's Water Transaction Program here in Salmon. Um, I, yeah, I really enjoyed the discussion before and just wanted to share with you guys what's been working for the Upper Salmon Basin for over 20 years, um, dealing with all the issues that were brought up tonight, um, stream flow, temperature, TMDLs, E. coli, managed recharge, irrigation efficiency, the whole deal. So this talk is really going to be a whole soup to nuts. What's water law and, um, you know, how, how we use it um, to, to manage everybody's uses um, for, for water in the upper salmon basin. So yeah, as I mentioned, I'm in the salmon field office where we have 31 active water transactions on 26 different tributaries and main stem rivers throughout the upper salmon river basin. Um, that's defined as the roughly 200 river miles that extends from the confluence of the Middle Fork Salmon River to the Salmon River headwaters in the Sawtooth Valley. Uh, tonight's presentation and it has to cover some basic principles of Idaho water law, what, wa what water transaction tools exist in the context of Idaho water law, and observe benefits to threatened anatomous and resident fish species over the last 20 years of water transactions in the upper salmon. Some of the water transaction tools we'll discuss tonight uh, include source switch projects, landowner administrative agreements, subordination agreements, water supply bank lease rentals, and water right acquisitions or donations. Uh, before we jump into these water transaction tools, I just wanted to step back and start with some basic facts about water law and how it's administered in Idaho. Idaho water law is founded on the prior appropriations principle, known simply as first in time, first in right which was developed to serve the practical demands of 19th century water users in the Western United States, where water rights filed first, typically in the late 1800s in Idaho, have the highest priority, and when water, availabil water availability is limited, water rights filed later in time are curtailed first. A water right must also define the water's intended beneficial use. For example, irrigation, stock water, mining, domestic, or municipal uses, and the water right continues so long as the beneficial use is maintained. Per the state constitution, in times of limited water availability, municipal water rights have the highest priority, followed by mining and then irrigation rights. Article 15 of the Idaho Constitution identified all waters within the state to be for public use, but subject to the regulation under, under laws passed by the state legislature, who in turn have delegated the Department of Water Resources the legal authority to administer this shared but limited resource. In 1965, a constitutional amendment was passed to create the governor appointed eight member Idaho Water Resource Board to work independently of, yet conjunctively with, the Department of Water Resources to implement projects and programs that, does, that support the sustainable management of Idaho's water resources for the beneficial uses prescribed by law including minimum stream flows that were adopted by the state legislature in the 1970s to protect aquatic life, recreation and aesthetics, the minimization of pollution for public health, and just the overall preservation of waterways for, for, for future generations of all Idahoans. The take home here being is that Idaho water law dictates how water transactions can be promoted by the Water Resource Board for minimum stream flows in the state's public waterways. For those of you new to water rights, everything you need to know regarding an active, any active decreed water right in the state can be easily accessed online at the interactive map portal on the IDWR website, where you can find a water right or a diversion spatially and follow the link to the water right report. The water right report includes all the critical information necessary for the proper administration of the water right, including the current landowner, its priority date, the source of water, its beneficial use, the season of use, its max diversion rate and the location and size of the place of use. For all water rights, there's a max diversion rate and a maximum number of acres that the water can be applied to for beneficial use. In this case, the water right holder has a 1911 priority date to divert 1.09 CFS from the Lemhi River from March 15th to November 15th to irrigate 36.1 acres. This is also critical information for developing water transactions. So talking about resource managers across the state, there is some common misconceptions when discussing minimum stream flows. So I just wanted to lay out the facts under the Idaho statute. 
When the state of Idaho adopted minimum stream flow as a beneficial use back in the 1970s, it also defined the Water Resource Board as the sole entity in the state that could hold such a minimum stream flow water right. This differs greatly from, from legal mechanisms for in-stream flow in other Columbia Basin states, where irrigation rights can be transferred to in-stream flow rights. The board's minimum stream flow rights define a monthly minimum threshold that when not met, the board can call for water to the minimum stream flow point of quantification, which is usually at the mouth of a tributary or below a critical habitat reach on a main stem river. Importantly, these minimum stream flows on paper do not automatically equate to minimum stream flows in waterways because these minimum stream flow rights are subject to the same first in time, first in right prioritization as any other water right. And many of the board's minimum stream flow rights were decreed during the Snake River Basin adjudication and negotiations leading to the Nespers Agreement in the early 2000s. Due to their 21st century priority date, these rights are extremely junior. Therefore, the board must seek opportunities to rent, subordinate upstream senior irrigation water rights that, be that can be called to help meet their minimum stream flow rights when they're not being met. For example, Looking at the board's minimum stream flow right on the East Fork Salmon River, if flows on the East Fork Salmon River above Little Boulder Creek are below 74 CFS in September, the board, the board can secure a water injection with an upstream senior water right that could be called to the minimum stream flow point of quantification um, and benefit migrating salmonids during this time of year. In contrast, where minimum stream flow refers to an actual water right that can only be held by the board, a target flow or a maintenance flow is a certain amount of water found necessary to provide adequate fish passage or ecosystem function by engineers and fisheries biologists when designing habitat restoration projects. These target flows may be achieved in specific stream reaches through landowner agreements and irrigation efficiency projects, but there is no legal protection for this water in stream and it could be diverted by downstream water users. So in the project pictured here, a water section with the senior water right ensures 4.5 CFS is made for fish passage in a head, headwater tributary, while the water user is utilizing a pump station in a non-flow limited reach on the main stem river. However, when the senior water right turns off their pivot and pump station, junior water right users on the tributary can divert to fill their water right. All right, now with some basics out of the way, I want to get into the meat and potatoes of what the water transaction is and how it works. It is widely understood that low stream flow is a major limiting factor for, salmon for salmonids at multiple life stages in the upper salmon river basin. The low stream flows negatively affecting salmonids generally occur when the greatest competition for water exists between in-stream flow needs for fish and when irrigation demand peaks. The fact that the upper salmon basin has been overappropriated, meaning there's oftentimes more demand for water than there is supply only exacerbates this competition. The Idaho Water Transaction Program focuses on protecting flow on paper, which requires expertise in water rights and Idaho water law. Water transactions differ from irrigation efficiency projects in that the water has to be legally protected in stream and on paper. The overarching goal of the program is to improve in stream flow in order to improve passage at all salmonid life stages, improve egg to smolt survival, reduce density dependent limiting factors, and increase aquatic species in diversity and abundance, and by proxy, improve water quality, like temperature, sediment, um, E. coli, TMDLs, the whole, the whole deal. Um, the Water Injection Program is primarily funded through, through BPA's Columbia Basin Water Injection Program and the State of Idaho Fish Accord, also with BPA, as mitigation for the hydroelectric dams on the main stem Columbia River. Transaction funds rarely come from NOAA's Pacific Coast Salmon Recovery Fund or in kind support from other sources. When developing a transaction, program staff first prioritize and the transaction with the Upper Salmon Basin Watershed Program technical team, which is administered by the Governor's Office of Species Conservation. Second, if a transaction involves renting a water right from the water supply bank or subordinating a senior water right to meet a board held minimum stream flow right, then program staff present a funding resolution at quarterly water resource board meetings to gain board approval. With board and local stakeholder backing, program staff then go to BPA for transaction funding. The take home here being is that transactions can take years to develop and, and ideally are structured to last at least two years, with many of our agreements on 20 year terms and some are in perpetuity. The first water transaction tool we'll discuss is the most widely used tool source switch projects and administrative agreements that reconnect tributaries to main stem rivers. 
Here we see the pre and post transaction photos where, where prior to 2018, Big Timber Creek was legally dewatered at a diversion located approximately 1.5 river miles upstream from the confluence with the Lemhi River near the town of Ledore. The dewatering of Big Timber Creek at this diversion was legal and authorized under Idaho water law, where Article 15, Section 3 of the Idaho Constitution states that all unappropriated water from natural streams shall be appropriated for beneficial use. This legal but lethal practice for fish highlights a challenge to incentivize water users to change their irrigation practices, of which they've been accustomed to for decades, to significantly alter their approach in order to protect fish and aquatic ecosystems. Therefore, economic incentives to protect flow in stream are critical to the continued success of the program and fish recovery. Source switch projects do not require a change in water right ownership or any loss in irrigation acres, but does require a change in point of diversion on the water right via an approved water right transfer from the regional IDWR office. Source switch projects require a large capital investment by our Upper Salmon Basin Watershed Program partners to convert from gravity flood irrigation to a pump and sprinkler irrigation system at the new point of diversion below the flow limited reach that the old point of diversion dewatered. Storage switch agreements in the Upper Sand Basin are accompanied by a minimum 20 year administrative agreement between the water transaction program and the water user not to divert from the old point of diversion and establish as a pay structure to cover the water user's annual pumping costs at the new point of diversion paid for by the water transaction program and in essence BPA. A PSA on storage switch agreements. The irrigation efficiency itself does not equal water transaction because any in-stream water savings is not legally protected from downstream water users. Remember Article 15, Section 3, all unappropriated water shall be appropriated for beneficial use. So we've picked our project sites accordingly in the Upper Salmon Basin. For example, a source switch project in Pole Creek with the most downstream water user resulted in a net savings of in-stream water after converting from flood to sprinkler irrigation and switching from surface water to groundwater sources. The resulting water savings is not legally protected from being diverted, but in the absence of another downstream point diversion on Pole Creek, this water savings helps to ensure hydrologic connectivity with the Salmon River near its, head, near its headwaters. Next, our most important water transaction tool on the Lemhi River are annual and permanent subordination agreements to meet the board's minimum stream flow water right at the L6 diversion located seven miles upstream of the confluence with the Salmon River. Since 2004, participating senior water right holders in the Lower High River voluntarily agreed to subordinate all or a portion of their water rights up to 100 days per irrigation season in order to meet the board's minimum stream flow water right of 35 to 25 CFS at the L6 diversion. Subordination agreements require no change in water right ownership and no change in point of diversion or place of use, but does require approval from the Water Resource Board. Administration of these agreements is carried out by the locally elected Water, water District 74 Water Master who is daily to rotate subordination of water rights among 10 to 15 water users to minimize loss in agricultural production while also meeting stream flows critical for both juvenile and adult chinook passage throughout the irrigation season. It cannot be overstated that proper administration of these agreements requires a trained and competent water master and also a good working relationship with members of the local water district. The program subordination agreements at L6 come in two flavors. First, water users can choose annual subordination agreements that compensate the water user at a fair market rate for each day they are subordinated in the irrigation season. Currently, that rate is $90 per CFS per day. Second are permanent subordination agreements, which are attached to the water right in perpetuity. At the time of signing, the water right holder receives compensation for the subordinated water based on recent land appraisals. In the Lower Lemhi River, this roughly amounts to $100,000 per CFS. The take home here being that agreements to, agreements to coordinate on their own only protect water on paper without a board held minimum stream flow water right at L6 to have the subordinated senior water rights called to, there would be no legal mechanism to protect the subordinated water in stream. And some pros and cons of these agreements, a pro of the short term agreement is that the, the cost of the water is much lower than the permanent easement. And the con is that they're risky because landowners change and the legwork of annual contract renewals is arduous. A pro of the permanent agreement is obvious that they stay with the water in perpetuity, even when the original landowner changes or the associated irrigation place of use is subdivided and converted to residential housing. And the con is that the initial investment is high and the water right must be very senior or it's not worth pursuing. 
Another wallet or transaction tool we use throughout the Upper Salmon Basin are lease rental agreements utilizing the Water Supply Bank, which is managed by Water Resource Board staff and IDWR's Planning and Projects Bureau, which also happens to the House Water Transaction Program. Typically, lease rental agreements must be renewed every five years. Lease rentals do not require any change in water right ownership or to the point of diversion, but does require all or a portion of an irrigated place of use to be idled while the associated water rights are in the water supply bank. Looking at the map on the left, we see 147 uh, irrigation acres associated with some bottom ground and corners of a place of use not covered by the pivot leased to the water supply bank. The map on the right shows the water per to those 147 acres in the water supply bank rented by the board to their minimum machine flow right at the mouth of the Pacimari River. Water spilled past this idled ground helps to reconnect Little Mud Springs Creek to the, to the main stem of Simroy for increased juvenile Chinook rearing habitat capacity. Importantly, when an irrigation water right is leased into the water supply bank and rented by the board for interesting flow, only historic consumptive use, which is the amount of water used by crops on the place of use, is available for rental to a board's minimum machine flow right. This is always less than the full duty of the water right, which includes non-consumptive conveyance losses from the point of diversion to the place of use. Some important uh, water supply bank lease rental steps to remember is to submit the water supply bank lease and rental application at the same time for expedient processing at the state office in Boise. When submitting a rental application, evidence of the historic consumptive use and active irrigation in the last five years must be provided. If there is any question on beneficial use in the past five years, review and analyze historic satellite imagery. For example, Sentinel infrared satellite imagery shows irrigated place of uses as bright red and idled place of uses in gray. Next, determine the valuation of the rental payment to the water user using production potential analyses from NRCS. Rental payments in the Upper Salmon Basin range from $20 to $57 per acre of idled ground. Lastly, keep in mind that the Water Resource Board must approve any rental application for terms longer than five years, and it must also be advertised for public comment. The last transaction tool we'll discuss are water right acquisitions or donations. These occur on a relatively rare basis and involves a water right change in ownership and the permanent idling of irrigated acres when a landowner donates or offers to sell a portion of their place of use and associated water rights to the board to promote habitat restoration efforts. The idled ground is typically, typically associated with the conservation easement negotiated by a local land trust or the conversion of private to public land then held in trust by a federal or state land management agency. It goes without saying that a water right donation or acquisition requires water resource board support and is also accompanied by a permanent water supply bank lease rental that undergoes additional scrutiny by IDWR's Water Rights Bureau. As stated previously, Idaho water law does not allow for the transfer of beneficial use from irrigation to interesting flow. An irrigation water right that is donated or acquired by the board, a local land trust, a tribe, or a federal agency must be leased to the water supply bank and then rented by the board to meet a board held minimum stream flow right in order to be protected both on paper and in stream. All right, now that we've talked about the tools in the water, water protection toolkit, here are some of the documented benefits to threatened anatomous and resident fish in the Upper Salmon Basin. For starters, the board has a lease rental agreement via the water supply bank with a water user on an important fluvial bull trout stream in the Sawtooth Valley. Water leased into the water supply bank is spilled past the water user's diversion and provides connectivity to the confluence of the Salmon River. Since connectivity has been restored with the Mainstone River, Idaho Fishing Games Anatomous Screen Program has monitored the fluvial bull trout utilizing the stream and has documented an increase in spawning distribution and abundance in this headwater tributary. Another program success story is the Bohannon Creek Source Switch Project that provides spawning and rearing habitat for steelhead. Prior to 2014, steelhead reds were at risk of drying up due to legal water withdrawals at the Bohannon Creek 3 diversion located three quarters of a mile upstream from the confluence of the Lemhi River. From 2014 to 2017, early season target flow agreements with the water users diverting from Bohannon Creek 3 maintained two CFS to the mouth of the creek to protect reds. In 2018, two senior water users at Bohannon Creek 3 entered into a source switch agreement and transferred their irrigation water rights from Bohannon, from Bohannon Creek 3 to a pump station on the Lemhi River. The water users now call for their water, spill it past Bohannon Creek 3, then re-divert it at the new pump station on the Lemhi River. 
This project expanded an anatomous fish distribution in Bohannon Creek with steelhead reds locate with steelhead red locations found up to three miles above Bohannon Creek three, where previously no steelhead reds were observed due to legal due to early season dewatering at the, at that diversion. The cost of pumping from the new pump station on the Lemhi River is estimated for a twenty year period, and the water users are compensated annually to cover those pumping costs. Upper Salmon Basin Watershed Program partners implemented the new irrigation infrastructure, including a pump station, pipeline, and pivots, which were necessary to complete the source switch transaction. Absent the compensation associated with the cost of pumping and capital investment from the project partners, the water users would not spill their senior water and would continue to flood irrigate and likely dewater Bohannon Creek below Bohannon Creek 3 for most of the irrigation season. Another example of, of a successful source switch tributary reconnect project is the P9 ditch removal at River Mile 15 on the Basimra River, which is one of the largest salmon producing tributaries in the Upper Salmon Basin. The P9 cross ditch diverted approximately 20 CFS from, from Patterson Big Springs Creek, point A on the map, flowed across a large alkali flat, gathering sediment and temperature, then dumped into the, into the Basimra River before being re diverted at the P9 diversion, point B on the map. Along the way, the cross ditch also intercepted and dewatered two spring-fed creeks, Duck Spring and Little Mud Springs Creeks. For those of you who haven't seen one of these, this is called a roster hydrograph. And this one was developed by, by our former Columbia Basin Water Transaction Program uh, monitoring coordinator. Red colors indicate uh, lower stream flow and yellow to purple colors indicate higher stream flows. The y-axis shows water years from 2005 to 2019 and the x-axis is showing uh, days of the year from April through September. You can see that before the cross ditch was removed in 2009, the Basimra River below P9 diversion was at or near zero CFS for most of the irrigation season, April through September. The removal of the cross ditch resulted in a water savings of nearly 15 CFS in this flow drainage of the Basimra. After the cross ditch removal, Idaho Fishing Game monitoring and valuation efforts resulted in a publication by Copeland et al. in 2021 titled Population Effects of a Large Scale Stream Restoration Effort on Chinook Salmon in the Persimmon River. They found that after removal of the P9 diversion ditch and remediation of diversion structures, Salmonids could access an additional 24 river miles on the Persimmon an additional 10.2 river miles on Patterson Big Springs Creek as well as 6.3 river miles of potential rearing habitat in Duck Spring, Little Mud Spring, and Little Springs Creeks. Monitoring efforts found that overall accessible rearing habitat post-transaction increased by 246%. And since 2009, 42% of Chinook salmon reds in the Pacific River Basin have been, be have been detected above the reconnected reaches. Additionally, juvenile productivity measured as smolt per female past Lower Grand Dam also increased significantly. And lastly, juvenile chinook densities above the old P9 cross ditch were a third of those observed in downstream sites, as seen in the graph showing median chinook par densities from downstream to upstream, with gray bars indicating pre-restoration par densities and white bars post-restoration densities. Taken together, this study indicates that the P9 cross ditch remediation is alleviating density-dependent limiting factors during freshwater rearing life stages for salmon in the Basimura Basin. To date, there are 11 permanent subordination agreements at L6 protecting 16.83 CFS permanently in the lower Lemhi River, and, si and six annual agreements at L6 protect an additional 15.4 CFS in the lower Lemhi River every year. In total, we have 32.23 CFS protected for 100 days per irrigation season past L6, with the long-term goal of having 25 CFS permanently subordinated by 2025. And our most likely avenue is to incentivize water users who have participated in the in, in annual subordination agreements for 10 plus years. These agreements address chronic dewatering issues that were caused by lawful irrigation withdrawals at the L6 diversion that typically dewatered the lower Lemhi River for weeks, if not months at a time between late July and early September, 7.4 miles from the confluence with the salmon. These agreements are absolutely critical to the maintenance of a migration corridor corridor for in-migrating adult Chinook and out-migrating juvenile Chinook that require passage past L6 for the duration of the irrigation season. By, allow, by allowing passage at L6, these agreements provide the Salmonids access to an additional 60 miles of the Lemhi River. The additional habitat includes 8.5 miles of primary spawning habitat on, on Hayden Creek and 11 miles of primary spawning habitat in the upper Lemhi River. 
The graph shows uh, data capture of all juvenile Chinook life stages at the Lower Lemhi River screw trap below the L6 diversion from 2013 to 2020. You can see a pulse of juvenile outmigrants early in the spring, riding, riding snow melt high water out of the basin towards the ocean. In the summer months, we then have adults migrating. In the summer months with uh, juvenile out, uh, out migration kind of tailing off, that's typically when you have adults migrating into the basin and up to the spawning grounds. Um, then late in the irrigation season, when stream flows are at their lowest, but water temperatures are beginning to drop because of the cooler nights, we see, long, we see another large pulse of juvenile outmigrants. And this um, February to, to November timeframe, when we have anadromous fish going past L6, really underscores um, the importance of maintaining this passage corridor during the, for the duration of the irrigation season from March to November. In 2021, we had obviously a really extreme drought year, as everybody should know. Um, and every effort was made to conserve our 100 days of subordination, uh, 100 days of subordinated water, water rights to prevent a watering event at L6. And in doing so, the minimum stream flow of, of 35 to 25 CFS was not always met. An irrigation, an irrigation season in Idaho lasts 243 calendar days. Typically, 100 days of, of subordination is more than enough to meet the board's minimum stream flow at the L6 diversion between spring runoff that tapers off in late June and when fall rains typically arrive in early October. But for the first time in the program's history, additional subordination days were required to maintain any flow at all past L6 late in the 2021 irrigation season. This was achieved by signing 30-day emergency drought response subordination agreements with three water users already participating in the program. In total, 123 days of subordinated water was paid for by the water transition program to maintain this passage corridor in 2021. And lastly, just some helpful hints for developing water transactions. Ideally, you should collect stream flow data prior to negotiating the water transaction with the water user or project partners. Gather any historical bi biological data if it exists. Remember to take plenty of before transaction photos. Importantly, work from the bottom up on rivers and creeks to ensure hydrologic connectivity by working with the most downstream water users first. Always discuss your plans with the regional IWR office the local water district and water master early on to determine if a water right transfer is required, help you determine the historic use of the water right, and determine if the proposed transaction is even administrable in stream. The mantra here being turn paper water into wet water, and critically develop, develop a monitoring plan. For example, is a continuous stream flow gauge necessary? Stream gauges require rated sections of streams that need a full year of periodic measurements at low and high stream flows to develop. Critically assess if you can afford to monitor this, these transactions. Because again, water transactions take years to develop and last from two to 100 years. And all multi-year transactions funded through the Columbia Basin Water Transaction Program that result in annual payments to water users require annual reporting on contract compliance, flow monitoring, and biological response. As of 2022, the program maintains 31 transactions on 26 streams, and we use 18 continuous continuous stream gauges, five of which are on telemetry. These stream gauges assist with monitoring stream flow, contract compliance, and the administration of water transactions in stream by the local water masters. These gauges are also used by local project partners to design habitat restoration projects or the monitoring of project outcomes. Currently, all our gauge stations are maintained by a contractor and average about $6,000 per gauge per year with telemetry costing thousands of dollars more than non-telemetry gauges because you're paying for that data to be hosted online and available in re real time for water users, water masters, project managers, um, the whole deal. Uh, our remaining streams are monitored for stream flow compliance using a, a flow measurement device on a monthly basis, which itself is a $10,000 piece of equipment. And lastly, all of our biological data in transactive stream ranges is compiled by Idaho Fishing Game and reported to BPA. Carmichael et al. in 2020 summed up how management of our freshwater ecosystems requires working simultaneously at multiple scales, from the site-specific to the watershed scale, in order to achieve salmon recovery goals. And I think this quote captures, captures the 10,000 foot view of why our regional partnerships are so vital to salmon recovery efforts, because despite everything I've discussed tonight, one of the biggest take-homes should be that water transactions do not happen in a bubble. 
They require your constant collaboration with any number of stakeholders. And one of the greatest assets to water transactions and fish recovery efforts in our area is the Upper Salmon Watershed Program Technical Advisory Team. Where limited funding is spent the wisest due to dealing project prioritization and each team member doing their part to achieve a common goal. And with that, I will stand for any questions. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Uh, John, thank you so much. I think uh, we've got just a few minutes before we wrap up the meeting. However, I want to know, like, uh, will you, can you put your email in the chat? Do you mind? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, um, cause I know I'm still processing a lot of the information and I appreciate your technical depth and expertise, but, um, let's go to the room or anybody online. Does anybody have any questions? To go to John Lavelle. Hey, John Lafredo, John Lavelle here. Um, just wondering when a new user gets a water right and starts irrigating, say in your watershed, like the Sawtooth Basin, uh, do you guys give them any information on the best practices or is it kind of left up to the, the water right owner to irrigate as they see fit? Um, it's definitely up for the water user to, to irrigate as they see fit. Um, we prioritize our projects based on um, uh, a lot of a lot of flow modeling and, ha and habitat modeling and, and fish data, and we try to pick our projects in, in areas where we think they're going to do the most good with at least for the least amount of money. So, yeah, anybody that's coming to the basin um, that's starting to irrigate, um, usually they're probably pretty much picking up where, where the last land landowner um, left off. Um, yeah, that's a good question though. <laughs> John, this is Wes. I have a question for you. I, when you started off, you said that uh, those minimum in-stream flows are obviously junior because they were they came about more recently. Um, but when you have a, a minimum in-stream flow, and then you let's say that's been in place, and you have a new uh, industrial or mining, let's say, uh, applicant, does that trump uh, the minimum in-stream flow? Or is it because it was, you know, even if it's after that minimum in-stream flow was in place? Um, if that's, if it's a new, if it's a new industrial or, or mining right, um, that, that, and if it, yeah, priority of 2022, um, that should be that should be subordinate to these minimum stream flow rights that have usually have a, a priority of about 2005, which is when the SRBA was finalized. So, um, for any existing irrigation right that's like from the 1800s, you know they're not subordinate to these minimum stream flow rights. But for any new right, it is subordinate to those minimum stream flow rights. John, um, I'm curious, like what, like walking into this, what what would be some like baseline information for getting uh, someone started? Like, I, I know you kind of just gave us to that, but like in a sentence, like, where do you go? And like, who do you talk to, you know? Um, I think it's definitely, you know, trying, trying to prioritize, go tributary by tributary, defining like, you know, defining what like, you guys are kind of talking about today to talk about what you guys are trying to get out of this. Um, what are the end goals? What do you want to see have happen in terms of water quality or, or fish recovery? And once you have what you want in place, I think then going and saying, okay, so where can we do the most good um, with the least amount of effort? Um, so I think like reconnecting tributaries, if you can work with the most downstream water user, sorry, this is not a sentence, <laughs> but uh, start, starting with the most downstream water users on tributaries for sure. Um, seeing if there's any room for uh, uh, water supply bank lease rentals, I think are, are pretty straightforward that um, don't require any irrigation efficiency uh, improvements or, or capital improvements. It's, it's really just kind of a paper exercise that um, then requires some, some administration by the water master to make sure the water that's being spilled past the diversion that has idled acres on it is being actually delivered to um, or can be delivered to that ministering flow right um, down, 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 down the way. Um, so yeah, sorry, not being really concise here, but. Uh. <laughs> no, it's I think that just means you have to come back. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy, happy to. Oh, that'd be great. Well, um, I want to uh, thank you for your presentation.